Now, if you haven't tried a whitetail water hole and it's appropriate for your land and your herd and the location you're at, um, you're really missing out. I love white water holes. Um, I've used water holes for a long time. Early 2000s, we started using tanks, splitting 55 gallon drums in a half and then putting them in the soil. We found quickly that 27 and a half gallons was not enough. I strongly encourage you don't use that little if you're gonna use a tank. Um, we've, we've settled on right around 100 gallons, seems about to be about that perfect size for installation below ground level and then filling. Water holes are a great addition to your habitat improvements and to your hunting improvements, to your hunting strategy. But there's a main tip that I wanna focus on that is very critical when it comes to water holes. Of course, we bury a tank if we're using about 100 gallons, 75 bucks at TSE, pretty easy to find. Um, bury them below the, the level of the ground. Um, you really don't have to fill them that often if they're in the shade. We're putting a stick in them to keep the rodents out so they can get out, so they're not dying in there. But after all that's said and done, the location of that water hole is so critical. And the number one tip that I can give you when it relates to a white tail water hole is do not put those water holes on a food source, on a food plot, in the ag land. Behind me is giant ag field and we have some corn that's from a food plot um, in the area. And that food plot's approximately 300 yards long. It's corn. They had some other plantings on top of it just behind me. The deer are still hitting it uh, often. They're getting any kind of remnant they can find. I'm standing right in front of a really high quality deer, deer trail that's going down, down to that location. The deer are already going to that food source. So when it comes to deer habitat management and creating deer habitat improvements, nothing should ever be random. You want those improvements to link together, to flow together. You want bedding to relate to food, travel in between. You want cruising opportunity. You want pinpoint stand locations. And if you're using a water hole in a food source, the deer are already going to the food source. That's already an attraction. So you're wasting an opportunity to create a bow hunting hotspot at that water hole right on the way to that food source. And I'll use this as an example. This food plot spreads for 100 yards that way, 200 yards that way. If I put a white to water hole right up here, right up on the major bench system that's probably still 75 to 100 yards away from me, if I do that on the other end over there, south, north, then what I end up having is a north water hole to hunt with south winds it'll blow out over the hollow on the other side and i can do the same with north winds on this side and it's all focusing on the deer that are living up in this bluff and and i know this bluff really well some of those deer are 400 yards up they're way up the hill 354 uh, more feet in elevation they're bedding up there and those will typically the be the bucks that are bedding up and it doesn't matter high low i don't want to get into that if if this water hole system was up top, then the bucks would be better bedding down here if that food is up there. So food high, bucks bed low. Food low, bucks bed high. But regardless, those deer are bedding dry up there by offering a water hole on either side with the wind advantage. Then I give them a precision stopping point to hit on the way to that major food plot system. And instead of, those, instead of those deer traveling anywhere they want into this food plot system through the side, then I can take 70, 80% of that movement and I can put it on either water hole on either side and, get, and offer myself a really defined precision movement for deer to hit that water hole out of dry bedding. They're sitting dry all day. The first thing they wanna do is hit that water. And then they transfer down to the food plot down here. It also works great because I find that bucks are loopers. Well, those might travel straight line right from their bedding area down to the food, back and forth, and they'll do that religiously every day. I find a buck moves more in a football movement. So if he's bedding way up on the ridge system, 300 yards away, he's gonna create a movement that comes to the side. If he has northerly winds, he's gonna circle, hit that water hole, and then he can come into this side of the food. And now he's scent checked 150 yards all the way to the water hole, all the way to the food source, and then he's coming into the wind into that food source. I find bucks, mature bucks especially, make that movement a lot more than does. They have that football shape movement. They, they move in circles, they move on the outside of cover where does just come straight to the food source and back. Setting up that water hole back in the woods I locate that in a position to where I can get in and out of that stand location all day long, any time of the day, 
even if there's a hundred deer on this food plot, they will not know that I'm getting into that water hole with any time that I access that water hole. I can get in and out and never spook a deer down here. And that's the name of the game with food plots too. By creating that water hole up here, water hole over there, the food plot points down here. I might even add a mock scrape around that water hole, around that stand. I might even have a stand closer to the food source with a mock scrape, but I'm making that alignment of habitat improvements where I have buck bedding, water hole, mock scrape, corner of food. I can thicken up that travel corridor in the way we have, I have lots of videos on creating travel corridors, bedding areas, hinge cutting for travel corridors or bedding areas. I'm setting up that line of movement. The water hole can be one of the biggest pieces of glue that holds that movement together. And the more I define how those deer move from bedding to water hole, to mock scrape, through travel corridor, to the corner of a food plot with the right wind on my side, then I can actually define how I access the land and make sure that when I'm accessing the land that I know deer are here traveling from point A to point B. That means I can travel here to stand number one, stand number two, stand number three. The more I can define that movement, pull those deer into that line of movement, the more I can non-invasively hunt the land with a low probability of spooking deer. Now let's face it, you can never say never when it comes to deer, but you're just playing the odds. I'm trying to stack 80% of the movement into five, 10% of the habitat as it relates to moving to that afternoon food source. That means I can get in and out without spooking that deer. I can preserve my land for the entire season. And it all boils back to food plots, bedding areas, of course, travel in between, but that water hole in a dry location where you have deer bedded dry and they want to turn towards that water source after eating roughage, woody browse, acorns, chestnuts, briars, shrub tips, whatever it might be back in their bedding ears. That's all great stuff for daytime browse. You don't want it to be at much higher level than that. But they're eating all that roughage. They want to hit water on the way to their afternoon food source. You're creating that line, that water holes an integral part of that entire relationship of bedding to afternoon food source movement and back again. Don't waste a water hole on a food plot where deer are already traveling. Now there are exceptions always, and it might be that you have the perfect small little fifth of an acre, tenth of an acre food plot. They can stick some water and it's on the way to a big food source, so deer just passing through. But even then, are you better off going 50 yards back offering that water before that small hunting plot, giving yourself two options to hunt, maybe even with different winds, and further defining even that small movement. So think about it. I visit too many parcels that have wasted their water opportunity on some man-made small shallow ponds that are perfect water holes in the sense of how it's created, but they're in the exact wrong spot where it's actually pulling deer away from your bow stand locations if it's located on that food. Think about the alignment. Think about putting water holes in the right location. Think about how that relates to further defining the movement so that you can actually access your land, not only non-invasively, but with a, a precision movement to sit in a highly defined stand location looking over one of Whitetail Habitat Improvement's greatest attractions, the Whitetail Waterhole.